Hello everyone and welcome to a new talk on uh, Nordic, respectively Norse culture. This is Irina. I'm a historian and a teacher. Welcome to my channel on both uh, topics related to Norse uh, culture and Germanic languages. Feel free to check out the rest of my videos and hit the subscribe button. Um, in this short contribution, I am going to discuss a little bit the issue of why medieval Icelanders wrote so much and so well, um, as well as um, uh, providing providing one example of uh, an incredible uh, manuscript uh, we uh, have uh, as an inheritance from this great culture of medieval Iceland. So by uh, contrast with the amount of written material surviving from um, other societies related to Norwegians and Norwegian culture, um, as well as from the Swedish and Danish areas, um, Icelandic textual production in the Middle Ages was definitely very varied and uh, extensive. And we must also say that um, people beginning with the medieval times have been wondering why um, Icelanders were so prolific in this um, um, in this literary uh, enterprise. Um, the Danish historian Saxo Grammaticus, for example, um, saluted the Icelanders as the historians of the whole world of Scandinavia. Um, and he also um, thought that, you know, maybe the long and dark nights of winter um, and the not so um, well off uh, landscape might have uh, stimulated their imagination and literary productivity. Um, there is also a um, book called the Thordar book. Um, it's um, um, a version of the book of uh, land takings of the settlements. Um, Landnama book um, is offering a different explanation. So in this book we find the idea that people um, often say that writing about their new home homeland, yeah, Iceland, um, is um, irrelevant learning, um, but that to Icelanders themselves, the truth about who they are, so their ancestry, their origins, was regarded very uh, relevant because it enabled them to uh, refute the claims of some foreigners that they descended from uh, either slaves or people with uh, some kind of criminal uh, record. So in any case, they wanted um, all people peoples to know of their uh, of their origins so their uh, their literary uh, writing as well as history writing um, was a building block of their cultural identity um, it is still true today that colonial and post-colonial societies are always interested um, and excited about their origins and they are frequently trying to create them using stories about their their past uh, both favorably and unfavorably uh, more or less seriously um, and this is done uh, almost always in contrast to the parent societies. So for the Icelanders themselves this motivation must have been strong um, also due to the rather unusual nature of their um, societal organization yeah because they did not have any kings uh, for example and um, also perhaps um, uh, the fact that some of them had actually been uh, descendants of slaves or at least of uh, poor emigrants would have made them um, yeah particularly sensitive to um, allegations of um, of the kind uh, the aforementioned uh, author and book uh, describe um, so um, if we keep uh, in mind that um, um, stress upon the importance of ancestry and societal social origins, um, a great deal of Icelandic uh, vernacular writing, so in the local language from the medieval period, can uh, some, somehow be connected to uh, the topics of history and genealogy. Um, well, this kind of exploration and explanation for the textual productivity might help us understand why Icelanders wrote so much. Um, on the other hand, it doesn't really account for the wide variety of genres they um, succeeded in, masterings, in mastering and to a large extent uh, developed uh, quite independently. Uh, nor does it account for the quality of um, a great deal of the work um, they, um, uh, they wrote. Um, 
in um, uh, the coming centuries, uh, scholars would argue that um, there was actually a mix of the oral uh, Norse tradition with um, the Latin literature of medieval Christendom and uh, some vernacular European genres such as the Chronicle and the Romance um, with the um, sources in um, England and Germany and France. And they as well might have provided the um, uh, dynamic for medieval Iceland literary production. Um, there could have been also the inspiration of the genre of the saint's um, life. Um, the Icelandic scholar uh, Sigurdur Nordal, for example, um, proposed that uh, a surplus of calf skins, um, so the so-called vellum, which had no useful purpose in the farming economy of Iceland, um, also provided um, material on which uh, they could have um, uh, they could have written. Um, besides this, however, it must um, be. Uh, insisted and acknowledged that without uh, a strong textual tradition, oral tradition, um, to start with, to have as a point of uh, reference, it is unlikely that this flowering of the medieval uh, Icelandic literature could have taken place um, at all. So there is good reason to believe that uh, this society um, valued this, um, uh, this oral creation particularly strong across a variety of, um, of modes, uh, both poetic and uh, narrative. And the sagas, um, as far as the evidence allows us to see, um, were a predominantly Icelandic uh, phenomenon um, resting upon this foundation that includes all these traditional modes and um, probably uh, developed uh, at least to some extent under the influence of non-native genres. By, but I must insist on this idea that um, oral um, poetry and narratives respectively uh, must have served as bases. Um, think about the fact that in the poetic Edda, uh, although written quite late in the 13th century, uh, many of these poems uh, would have been at least uh, two centuries older uh, than this. And uh, we have enough uh, linguistic evidence to to, um, to illustrate this aspect. Most of the medieval Icelandic literature that survives was preserved in the form of manuscripts from the 13th century and later, and um, the only suitable material for the leaves of books was uh, the vellum, like I said before. This was made from animal skins. In the case of Iceland, uh, it was calf skin. Uh, the details of the process by which this, uh, these skins were converted to vellum um, are unclear and yeah, pretty much uh, lost. Um, might have been that they differed uh, from those used in continental Europe at the time. Um, but um, yeah, we can uh, guess how uh, this was, um, uh, this was um, going on. So um, after the skin was processed to remove the hair, it was set into a frame. Uh, it was stretched as it dried in order to create a flat leaf and the drying process was carefully controlled in order to create high quality vellum. So for example, water was applied to dampen the skin if it were drying too quickly um, or chalk was applied to draw out the moisture if it was um, drying too uh, slowly. And after the drying, um, the skin was cut to size for the larger books, the skin was folded in half to make two leaves, uh, so that meant four pages, and then the sheets were gathered, usually in groups of eight sheets. Larger books were typically writ written in two columns, and um, the columns were laid out, marked with pinpricks, then marked with uh, light lines. Um, in some manuscripts, traces of these lines uh, still survive. Uh, and then the real chore began, so the scribe began to um, write the book. Um, for that, um, one would use uh, quill pens, uh, typically from a goose or a swan. Um, the point was carefully trimmed and then hardened by heating in hot, uh, hot sand. As for the ink, this was usually made from berries, um, some of the same dyes using for coloring uh, black cloth. Um, the process of making a book, you can imagine, was both time consuming and very expensive. So, for example, um, for the Flatuyar book, um, from where I uh, picked up the images for this presentation, the skin of 113 calves was used to create the 225 leaves making up the book. It's very hard to conceive the value of uh, this 
amount of raw material. Um, and at the time, even a single milk cow could mean the difference between a family um, surviving over the winter or not. And to sacrifice more than 100 uh, milk cows to make one book speaks to the value uh, these books actually had in this um, in this area. Um, the scribes themselves uh, sometimes uh, describe the difficulty of their work in the form of marginal notes. So uh, in some manuscripts, you are going to find stuff like um, I am very bored by writing this or um, my eyes and uh, kidneys and uh, joints uh, hurt because of all the writing. Um, so regarded, uh, regardless of the labor needed to create the book, um, just the uh, calls alone seem to be so valuable that it seems likely that actually only the rich uh, were able to afford such a thing. Um, after the writing was complete, this uh, group of sheets um, was uh, soon together, bound between wooden boards, held together with straps. Um, there is no evidence that these boards were decorated, but manuscripts, on the other hand, are decorated with um, illustration and maybe also illumination and a wide variety of pigments was um, was available. Um, the coming of the printing press um, did not actually change uh, fundamentally the way books were made in Iceland. Um, the first printing press in Iceland was um, um, set up in about 1530. Um, the press, however, was under the monopoly of the church, uh, so this means that only religious works were published. Um, after the introduction of uh, paper, inexpensive paper, um, it became much more affordable for someone to have his own copy of the book, um, as well as much uh, easier, as you could, um, uh, could imagine. And um, we have examples of medieval texts that have survived only in late paper manuscripts with no vellum manuscripts of the uh, saga uh, known to have uh, survived. Um, so uh, these vellum copies uh, unfortunately lost their usefulness and many were actually probably discarded or used to some other purpose. So for example, to make the soles of, um, of shoes or as patterns for, uh, for clothing. Um, the surviving sagas themselves attest to the wide variety of lost uh, of lost literature. So some of the sagas, for example, refer to stories uh, that are not known to have survived. Um, for example, in uh, Lagstaila saga, uh, we have reference to some incidents in other sagas um, otherwise unknown. Um, to end this point, um, I will uh, only mention the fact that uh, by the 17th century, interest in the Icelandic literature was growing in Europe and uh, prompted a very well-known scholar by the name of uh, uh, Arni Magnusson to collect and preserve the existing manuscripts um, and the print printed editions were prepared as well as translation in um, uh, Latin and many other modern languages. Um, and one example of this is uh, the Edda of Snorri Sturluson, published in the 17th century in 1665, to be more exact, in, um, uh, in Copenhagen. I am going to move on to the third and last part of this uh, short presentation by talking a little bit about uh, yeah, the Flatoyar book. Already mentioned that these pictures uh, you could see here uh, are from this, uh, from this book. Um, it is probably the finest manuscript that Iceland has ever produced. Um, and um, its importance as Iceland's national treasure is made clear when uh, this, um, uh, this book, along with the Codex Regius, the one containing the famous poetic Edda, was demanded to be the first manuscript to be returned to Iceland from Denmark after Iceland gained its uh, independence. So this huge manuscript, um, it's about A3 sized, contains a series of sagas uh, related to the lives of Norwegian kings and annals from the creation of the world up to roughly when the book uh, was, um, uh, was finished. Um, yeah, so um, as to the 
origins of this book. This is also very interesting. The manuscript seems to have been commissioned by a wealthy uh, farmer from northwestern uh, Iceland. Um, Vididalstunga was the name of the place and the name of the farmer was Jón Håkonarsson. Um, and he had great interest in literature, as you could probably uh, guess. And uh, for the job, he hired uh, two priests, actually. Um, so uh, one of them, Jorn, he scribed the sagas of uh, Eric uh, the Far Traveler, uh, of uh, Olaf Tryggvason, of Saint Olavur, and then the other priest, Magnus, took it from, uh, from there and illustrated afterwards the uh, entire work. Um, we get to know all this important information because the manuscript is graced with an introduction which identifies both the ownership and the penmanship, uh, which actually makes this, um, this particular collection of stories rather unique compared to other medieval uh, manuscripts. Um, there are several possible locations uh, where the manuscript may have been made. Um, maybe at uh, Helga Fettl or um, uh, Reinistader or um, uh, Thingeirar. Anyway, um, a uh, church facade depicted in one, um, in one historiated initial resembles the seal in one of these uh, places I mentioned uh, before. Um, anyway, uh, this, um, uh, this manuscript had been kept within uh, Johan Håkonarsson's family for many generations until it was gifted to, uh, to the bishop um, Brynjolvur um, and taken to uh, Skalholt in 1647. And around that time, King Frederick III of Norway in Denmark was requiring, um, requesting books for, for the Royal uh, Library. And uh, he wrote to the bishop to ask, from, uh, to ask for the manuscript and um, uh, Brynjolvur uh, did send the manuscript to Denmark where it stayed until late in 1971. Um, yeah, so whereas the focus of, um, of this manuscript is the sagas of the kings, um, other uh, collections uh, focus rather on, um, uh, on the um, uh, sagas of the Icelanders, for example. Um, in addition to this uh, great preservation condition and to its size, um, what we need to remember about this uh, Flatoyar book is the fact that it is beautifully illuminated. This was also a little in unusual for Icelandic manuscripts. Um, so um, you don't need to be an expert to realize that this really was uh, intended to be uh, to be a great gift for someone, a truly um, a true showpiece. Um, and um, well, regarding uh, for whom the book was uh, um, actually uh, meant, um, this is still under debate. Um, it might have may have been intended as a gift to the teenager king Olaf the Fourth, um, who was named after Saint Olaf and was just uh, 16 uh, years old when um, um, this uh, wealthy farmer Jorn began this um, uh, tremendous project. Um, what indicates this is, for example, the fact that his um, uh, paternal grandfather used to be a member of the Norwegian royal court. So, um, well, it should not surprise us um, that uh, Jorn was actually trying to, uh, to achieve the same. If this boy king was the intended recipient indeed, um, then the king's sagas would have been intended as, um, you know, stories of um, uh, exemplary uh, value, of moral value for, uh, for him. So the king was supposed to learn something from these old stories uh, for, um, about his ancestors. Uh, but unfortunately, he died just when uh, the manuscript was barely begun and um, the news did not uh, reach Iceland until next summer. So whatever high hopes um, Jon the farmer may, uh, may have had, it was, um, it was destined to be a lost cause. Um, 
Well, in the medieval times, so to us, it is uh, not a lost cause. On the contrary, it is one of the most beautiful and important uh, manuscripts to have ever survived, not only medieval Iceland, but um, the European um, Middle Ages uh, overall. Yeah, so um, this was my short contribution on the topic uh, why Icelanders wrote so much and so beautifully. Um, I will continue uh, to talk about these Norse topics as well as uh, about uh, some aspects uh, regarding Germanic languages. If you enjoy my talks, please like and subscribe and follow my channel. Thanks a lot. Um, stay safe and yeah, I gladly welcome you to my future talks. Goodbye.